So, um, I'm trying to, uh, some way, define uh, the context of what I'm talking about uh, in uh, a meeting devoted to, is it working? E questo? To atypical cases. Neanche quello bianco funziona, mi sembra. Okay. Okay, these are my disclosures. Now, um, as Bruno Dubois has uh, underlined, Alzheimer's disease is uh, probably the most uh, frequent cause of atypical dementias, but I'm not talking about the atypical variants, but this in some way argues for Alzheimer's disease being uh, included in uh, the realm of atypical dementias. Uh, in the recent years, an increasing interest has been devoted to the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. This is because we developed biomarkers and neuroimaging techniques that allowed us to investigate and characterize Alzheimer's disease since the early stages and to differentiate it from atypical dementia, as uh, Bruno has already uh, said. Uh, the problem is, and what I'm trying to do in the next uh, 15 minutes, is to give some answer to what exactly is early Alzheimer's disease. Is it a real clinical entity? Is it a well-defined neuropathological entity? Which are the biological neuroimaging correlates? And at the end, how can this entity be uh, clinically detected or in the real world detected? Now. Uh, in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years, uh, there was, uh, we assisted to a, a, an evolution of uh, uh, lexicon and criteria uh, for Alzheimer's disease, uh, mainly based on the evidence that the different stages of Alzheimer's disease uh, up to uh, a frank dementia state can be in some way characterized by different neuropathological, uh, let's say, uh, marker or surrogate markers, uh, tackling beta amyloid, tau, uh, brain structures, uh, and eventually cognitive and behavior. Uh, in the last years, uh, uh, we had also evidence that uh, through tau ligands and uh, uh, tau determination in CSF, uh, we are able to uh, in some way uh, in identify uh, either tau-related pathologies. Uh, there has been a, a main interest in uh, uh, marching leftward uh, in the research uh, realms uh, and to define uh, what came before uh, a frank status or stage of dementia. So we define early Alzheimer's disease according to research criteria, uh, but uh, later on uh, the same uh, international working group uh, start to talk about uh, earlier uh, stage of Alzheimer's disease uh, and uh, proposing different criteria for identify these two high risk uh, populations. So. Uh, merging together the National Institute of Aging criteria and the International Working Group criteria, we have uh, a classification of Alzheimer's disease that ran, ran from preclinical uh, stages through prodromal stages, uh, through mild cognitive impairment uh, to mild Alzheimer's disease. And all the stages uh, can be in some way uh, characterized by some positivity to definite specific biomarkers. So according to these uh, groups uh, and to the criteria that have been proposed by these groups, uh, a beta biomarker seems to be sensitive to the preclinical stages. Uh, then uh, a beta biomarker can be linked to tau biomarkers for uh, defining the prodromal stage and the mild quantity impairment stage, and the narrow degeneration biomarker might be helpful in identifying, uh, uh, let's say, later stages where dementia came. So, early Alzheimer's disease refers to an entity 
characterized by the presence of pathophysiological biomarker signature, characteristic for Alzheimer's disease, either in the absence of specific clinical symptoms or in the presence of mild cognitive impairment. Now there is a rising interest in the scientific community to define such an early target population because of the failure of most, not all, but most recent clinical trials, despite evidence of a biological effects on brain amyloidosis for some of these compounds. Now, the question is which are the pathophysiological signature of early Alzheimer's disease? We know what are the pathophysiological signature for Alzheimer's disease, and most of the Alzheimer's disease refer to dementia, but as Bruno said, there is another, uh, early Alzheimer's disease is a completely another issue. Now, the narrow pathological criteria we use. Uh, the first pathological criteria uh, underline the density of total amyloid plaques, both diffuse and neuritic in any cortical field. The presence of neurofibrillary tangles was not required, whereas diffuse plaques had the same consideration as neuritic plaques. These criteria, uh, despite very, a very high sensitivity, had low uh, sufficient uh, specificity and were abandoned. Uh, and for some years, uh, uh, since 1991, the consortium, uh, the CIRAD criteria have been followed. This criteria propose more specific diagnostic criteria by emphasizing the importance of neuritic plaques over diffuse plaques, uh, mainly in uh, those uh, most severely affected regions of the isocortex. Uh, although this criteria had uh, higher specificity uh, compared to Kachaturian criteria, still they proved to be still insufficient because they did not incorporate the scoring of the severity of narrow fibrillary tangles that, on the other hand, uh, were mainly uh, based uh, on the, the item that Brack and Brack in some way emphasized for uh, staging Alzheimer's disease. So the Brack and Brack criteria uh, underlie the importance of neurofibrillary tangles, uh, uh, mainly at uh, the isocortical stages one, five, and six. This show a high specificity at expenses of a low sensitivity. Now the current neuropathological criteria are a sort of emerging uh, criteria of these two uh, origin. And they, uh, in some way, uh, distinguish three probabilistic diagnostic categories. High likelihood, if there are frequent neuritic plaques and abundant isocortical neurofibrillary tangles, so Brax and Brax stage five and six. And I was underlined the neuritic plaques and abundant isocortical neurofibrillary tangles, they will come later on. The intermediate likelihood, if there are moderate narrow neuritic plaques, and narrow fibrillary tangles are restricted to limbic regions. Low likelihood means no Alzheimer's disease if there are infrequent neuritic plaques and narrow fibrillary tangles restricted to enthronal cortex or hippocampus. Thus, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease should be made only when the criteria for intermediate and high likelihood of Alzheimer's disease are met and the patient has a clinical history of dementia or a clinical history of uh, cognitive impairment. In fact, there are some uh, uh, recent uh, evidence and findings. Uh, beta amyloid burden and load uh, affect some uh, frontal regions. These are the study from Bateman. Uh, showing that, uh, in fact, beta amyloid accumulate uh, uh, at the cortical level, but not only at the cortical levels, but also subcortical levels, mainly in the striatum. And actually, the striatum seems to be more affected in these uh, uh, mutation carriers uh, uh, many years before uh, <laughs> the onset of dementia. On the other side, Longitudinal perspective clinical pathological studies in non demented elderly people have revealed that up to 45%, probably even more, of non demented elderly would met the NIA 
Reagan Institute criteria for Alzheimer's disease had they been demented. Usually the intermediate likelihood category of this criteria and rarely the high likelihood category. Or right, this data have been recently uh, extended by Clifford Jackson and the group uh, by the study using uh, PIB uh, and ligand showing that uh, when we go uh, in uh, the later years of life, uh, the number of uh, subjects showing amyloidosis uh, are very frequent, uh, beyond 50%. Uh, and some people, 30% of the group uh, after 75 years old or 8 years old, uh, show neurodegeneration in the presence uh, uh, in the absence of amyloid negative, but still uh, there is a group showing amyloid positive, neurodegenerative positive, still being cognitively intact. So uh, accumulating amyloid and accumulating some neurodegeneration doesn't mean per se to uh, be demented or to develop uh, a demented illness. On the other side, this uh, recently uh, studied by Donway. Uh, seems to, uh, in some way, elucidate uh, the impact of uh, uh, brain amyloid over the subsequent uh, cognitive decline in cognitively normal person. As you can see here, in fact, patients with uh, evidence of uh, beta amyloid in the brain uh, has a, a high risk to develop uh, an increase in CDR sum of boxes scores or to show uh, memory impairment, whereas subject without amyloid burden uh, maintain uh, their cognitive uh, performance uh, uh, as the baseline. Uh, but what is more important is the, the, the percentage of individuals uh, that develop symptoms consistent with the prodromal stage. There was 32% after four years in those that had elevated amyloid compared to 15% of individuals with normal amyloid. And after 10 years, even the population is really small, so it needs to be confirmed, 88% of individuals with elevated amyloid were estimated to progress based on the CDR global assessment compared to 29% of individuals with normal amyloid. Okay. On the other side, tau, and uh, alteration of tau metabolism and phosphorylation tau is uh, essential to the neurotoxicity of beta amyloid and there is no dementia uh, without uh, tau uh, degeneration. In fact, tau is uh, correlated to the severity of the cognitive impairment whereas uh, amyloid seems not to be correlated. Uh, this has been uh, demonstrated by neuropathological studies, but uh, in the last uh, five years uh, has been increasingly demonstrated by using uh, tau ligands and uh, beta amyloid ligands uh, by PET. In fact, there is uh, a strong evidence that tau ligands or tau positivity is linked not only to hippocampal atrophy, but to minimental score progression and CDR, sum of boxes progression, whereas amyloid load seems not to be correlated to uh, hippocampal atrophy or cortical atrophy, as well as to clinical uh, markers. So uh, we are facing a, a sort of a paradox. Beta amyloid is uh, uh, fundamental uh, one of the uh, main uh, uh, pathological hallmarks of the disease. And in advanced stages, there is a, a perfect correlation between A-beta uh, depositions and uh, phosphorylation tau. Uh, but this is uh, mainly in stage five and stage six, uh, where Alzheimer's disease uh, can be uh, diagnosed with certainty or high likelihood. Uh, but we don't know exactly what is uh, happening in the earlier stages. What is coming from uh, using uh, PET ligands in vivo in subjects uh, seems to confirm a view that P 
pet, uh, the tau degeneration, tau degeneration accumulates uh, mainly in uh, uh, medial temporal uh, areas uh, and uh, at the hippocampus, uh, whereas beta amyloid seems to accumulate mainly uh, in uh, cortical regions and subcortical regions. And then eventually, uh, at a certain point, these two processes seem to confluence together and to uh, develop synergistically, making the disease uh, uh, more clear. So amyloid plaques and narrow fibrillary tangles seems to co-occur in Alzheimer's disease, but with different topological and temporal patterns. Whether these two lesions are independent or pathobiological or strictly related is still uncertain, as Bradley Hyman has uh, uh, claimed. In human patients with Alzheimer's disease, tau containing tangles and amyloid beta plaques have distinct anatomical distributions with plaques occurring in widespread areas of the cortical mantle and tangles occurring in a stepwise manner from medial, temporal, low barriers to affect uh, at the end eventually limbic and association areas in the cortex. It has been also observed that tangles rarely occur in the cortex unless plaques are present. And this is of uh, uh, clinical importance because cognitive symptoms are mostly tightly tied to the presence of neurofibrillary tangles in the cortex, uh, in some way uh, supporting the criteria for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. Thus, two competing ideas have emerged. Plaques and tangles are two underlying pathologies in Alzheimer's disease that simply co-occur in the cortex during the disease course, or the presence of plaques in the cortex trigger or accelerates uh, tau pathology. Until recently, this lesion could not be detected during life or in vivo and, can be, and could be evaluated only at uh, autopsy. But now, uh, by combining tau ligands and beta amyloid ligands, has it made possible to test the hypothesis that extensive tau pathology will occur only in the setting of substantial cortical amyloid deposition or whether cortical tau binding is most common in subjects with elevated measures of abeta deposition in cortex. Now, there is evidence uh, that uh, tau accumulate, tau metabolism is altered and can be uh, measured by tau, different tau ligands. And uh, the preliminary findings show, in fact, that. Uh, there is a strict correlation with uh, severity of symptoms and progression disease. But more important, uh, the question whether these two phenomena are linked together or, or separated and eventually they uh, confluence together came from uh, very recent studies uh, from different groups. I'm just citing this, but there are at least three uh, groups showing more or less the same thing with different ligands. As you can see here, there is an accumulation of uh, tau-related uh, neuropathology in uh, older subjects uh, compared to young subjects, cognitively impaired, uh, cognitively uh, healthy, uh, in uh, amyloid-negative subject that uh, uh, in some way interest uh, uh, subcortical regions uh, and medial temporal uh, areas. In a subject where uh, PIB is positive, so uh, cognitively unimpaired subjects uh, uh, older than 75 uh, with PIB positive, there is an extension of tau-related uh, pathology in uh, uh, cortical areas uh, uh, affecting inferior temporal areas and lateral temporal areas. And in Alzheimer's disease patient, obviously there is a widespread neurofibrillary or tau positivity uh, affecting uh, uh, the cortices. Now, uh, this study seems to, uh, in some way, demonstrate and uh, support the view that uh, cognitive impairment assessed by minimental or other cognitive measures, uh, especially in subjects under the age of 75, is uh, uh, correlated to neural and dysfunction, whereas amyloid seems <laughs> not to be. Uh, 
the results are consistent with the hypothesis that tau and amyloid pathology may begin independently. And yesterday, this has been uh, in some way uh, suggested by defining part or age-related uh, age related tau uh, gliopathy with the suggestion the spread of tau beyond mesial temporal lobe in Alzheimer's disease associated with, maybe dependent on amyloid accumulation. Together, this result seems to support that uh, tau ligands uh, and PET imaging uh, may be useful for, uh, in some way, aiding diagnosis, staging disease, and monitoring the effect of Alzheimer's disease therapies. Now the problem is in term, going back to clinical. How can we uh, detect, uh, identify, screen early Alzheimer's disease uh, subjects? Should we, or is it feasible to give PET, amyloid PET and tau PET and eventually CSF to all at-risk subjects? Or should we move to a different uh, level uh, and use uh, different uh, markers. So this made us uh, to explore uh, a different pathway. Now there is evidence that amyloid precursor protein may express synaptic localization activity of the choline transported. So there is a, a string, a strict correlation between amyloid metabolism and cholinergic dysfunction. On the other side, there are several findings stressing the relationship between tau pathology and GABAergic and glutamatergic impairment. Now, this made a, a, the background for using uh, cortical stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and I have to thank Alberto Benussi, Valentina Cantoni, and Barbara Boroni for having opened this uh, window in studying patients not only frontotemporal patient, but also Alzheimer's disease patient. We have different conditioning stimuli and different inter <coughs> interval uh, stimuli. Uh, we can collect different uh, parameters, uh, mainly uh, intracortical inhibition, intracortical facilitation, and afferent inhibition. All these parameters, uh, uh, in some way, mainly uh, are sensitive to uh, the gabaergic transmission, the glutamatergic transmission, and the cholinergic transmission. So we started to uh, uh, study patients uh, with dementia due to different diseases, mainly Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia subjects, uh, and compared them with healthy controls. Uh, all these patients and subjects were uh, investigate with MRI, CSF analysis of PET amyloid. TMS was uh, adopted and eventually some uh, uh, cutoff scores were used to uh, perform a rock analysis. So these are the data. As you can see here, this is uh, uh, the curves of uh, normal controls. Uh, this is the intracortical inhibition, and this is the intracortical facilitation curves. These are the curves of patients with Alzheimer's disease, and this is the curve that we observe in frontotemporal demented patients, showing uh, a glutamatergic uh, dysfunction uh, along with a GABAergic dysfunction. And when we uh, move to cholinergic uh, innervation and cholinergic transmission by uh, Starting the psi curve, uh, this is what we observe. This is the curve of uh, normal control. These are the curve of uh, frontotemporal dementia patients, showing that in this uh, type of dementia, there is no cholinergic dysfunction. And this is the curve we observe in Alzheimer's disease patient, in some way arguing for a selective cholinergic transmission deficits. These are the, the raw curve uh, showing uh, high sensitivity, high specificity, frontotemporal dementia versus Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease versus normal control, and frontotemporal versus uh, <coughs> normal control. Um, when we study uh, frontotemporal mutation carrier not affected, so uh, subjects, uh, normal cognitive 
subject uh, color of the frontotemporal mutation. Um, these are the curve we observe. Again, this is the curve of normal control. These are the curve of frontotemporal demented patient. And these are the curve of frontotemporal mutation color. So there is a <coughs> ICF uh, uh, compromise in subject uh, uh, completely normal. And this made us to uh, extend our investigation to MCI subjects. Now, MCI subjects, we use uh, the IVG and NIA criteria for characterize MCI due to Alzheimer's disease and an MCI not due to Alzheimer's disease. We collected so far more than 70 subjects. Some of them were uh, excluded because of divergent, the contrasting result. We were able to collect so far uh, MCI due to Alzheimer's disease because of a positivity to amyloid biomarkers and subject uh, uh, diagnosed as MCI non -ID. And these are the data. As you can see here, uh, Psi was uh, many compromise uh, in uh, most patient classified as MCI due to AD. And the CG and ICF curves were mainly uh, altered in subject with uh, MCI not due to Alzheimer's disease. And these are the raw curve in our accuracy score, uh, stressing and in some way confirming that uh, neurophysiological biomarkers uh, can be useful for identify uh, at least Alzheimer's disease patient even in the MCI stage and frontotemporal dementia even before. So the conclusion are, Experimental and preliminary clinical studies to support the view that targeting amyloid is a key strategy to prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease. Early stages of Alzheimer's disease are characterized by both amyloid burden and nerve fibrillary degeneration. We don't know what are the mechanisms, which are the mechanisms by which amyloid burden develop, and we don't know which are the mechanisms by which amyloid variably affect tau metabolism. We know that neurophysiological biomarkers may represent an adjunctive tool to select early Alzheimer's disease to investigate the impact of amyloid burden and tau-related neuropathology. These are my knowledge, in particular Barbara Boroni, Antonella Alberici, Alberto Benussi, Andrea Pilotto, and all the others, and the groups we are working together. Thank you for your attention.